Thank you. 
So here we are. We've made it. We've made it to the end of uh, the EdCollab gathering. Um, this day has been incredible. It also feels like it flew by literally at the speed of light. Um, I, I personally have enjoyed uh, watching in on sessions, following along on Twitter. Um, again, it's one of those places where I wish that that I could be in every session all at the same time. And the good news is. I can, and so can you. You can come back to the archives whenever you'd like to see um, the sessions there as well. Um, before we get to our closing session in just a few moments, I just have a couple of um, announcements and thank yous and um, some, some other things, including we will announce in just a moment um, our date for our September, our fall, the Ed Club gathering, as well as our whoever our morning keynote will be, um, and how you can be involved in that process as well too. Um, so first, uh, just some announcements uh, and and some other thank yous. So as as you've been hearing us say across the day, um, in this free day, we invite you to pay the joy you found today forward. If there was a moment today. Um, or possibly several, but if there's even one moment today that is inspiring you, changing the way you think about your instruction, about your children, about your colleagues, about your work. I know I, I had many of those today. Um, please consider paying that joy forward. Go to gathering.theeducatorcollaborative.com backslash charity, and there you can see the three incredible charities, Urban World NYC, Urban Creators, and Morningside Center for Teaching Social Responsibility that our morning keynote authors um, chose. When you go to that webpage, gathering.theeducatorcollaborative.com backslash charity, there uh, you will see um, uh, some brief stories from our morning presenters um, to know uh, why they chose them and why they personally matter to them. Um, we don't, uh, the, all of your, your charity dollars don't go through us. We just link you directly to their websites. Um, so if you'd like to let us know that you donated and spread the word to others, you'll also find a button on that page where you can add a, a fancy schmancy a little logo to your Twitter handle or to your Facebook uh, uh, page. Um, that you can share with others that you've paid the joy forward today. So thank you for doing that. It means so much to, to us personally um, that we as an educator community um, can just spread great work into the world. Um, ben, thank you, thank you from the, the, the top of the mountains I am yelling, thank you. Um, thank you to our incredible tech team. Um, so here's the thing to know about this amazing tech team. The tech team is made up of educators, uh, folks just like you viewing today, just like you who are presenting, who volunteer their time. All of these people have just said, I would like to help make this thing that we're doing, this gift to our profession possible. And so they um, have given up their time, not just today, but these also are people who, in addition to their family lives and their school life and their grading papers and their visiting classrooms or everything else that they do, um, they also have taken time leading up to today to, uh, to help prepare the presenters. So they've had um, evening sessions, morning sessions, afternoon sessions, um, just helping everyone feel successful and, and ready for today. So today would not be possible without them. There are their Twitter handles. It would mean the world to me if you would tweet these people, follow them, just say thank you. Carolyn Hilarious um, for now our fifth time. Oh my gosh, Carolyn, it's been so long for our fifth time has uh, led our Twitter tech team. She is the glue that helped to hold everything together, um, sent out messages to everyone. Thank you, thank you, Carolyn. Um, and then other members of the team, we have some returning members, Lauren Vassalini and Diana DaCosta have come back with us for um, returning years of leading the team. And then this year, um, we have two new members, um, Claire Landrigan, who last uh, last gathering presented with her um, co-author and partner, Tammy, um, a partner in crime uh, in education, Tammy. Uh, Claire now joined us for uh, the tech team. So thank you, thank you, Claire, for doing that. Um, and uh, Melissa Wally, thank you as well. Um, really, it's these folks that make the day possible. And now just, just for some real talk for just a minute, um, we need the tech team. We need folks who can be a part of this community to help make the day run. And, and just to have real talk, that often is the hardest thing to find, <laughs> the people who are willing to be behind the scenes and make stuff happen. So if you would like to be a part of this day in a profoundly important way that also, I, well, I'll, I'll just speak on behalf of everyone, I think is, is kind of really empowering and exciting too. Um, we all join together on a Voxer group all day long. 
um, constantly working with one another to solve problems, make sure things are working well. Uh, you learn a skill set around uh, presenting and supporting presenters in this way and some technology around it too. Um, but really, those folks make the day happen. So, so I, I'm going to make this a public, not just an ask, but a like a please, please, please. If you ever in your wildest dreams have thought maybe you'd want to be a part of, of the back end of the gathering to, to uh, share uh, your time and your talents and supporting other presenters, learning how this works and making the day really run, we always, always, always need tech team members. Um, so please, please consider joining us. Um, we will be so, so eternally grateful for always and forever. And plus, I just think it's it's a really rewarding, exciting experience. Um, I also just, just to say, March was kind of a tough time um, for my family and I. There was uh, lots of things going on. And uh, all of these people, uh, including Amy Kaiser, our administrative assistant, who uh, made this slide so she didn't put her name on it, um, I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to this group. Um, you made today possible um, at times when I was like, working on, a, uh, I was kind of threadbare. Um, and and I, I just, I, I feel so lucky to, to have you as partners in today. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, also, a big giant thank you to presenters today. Holy cow, are you guys amazing. Um, and here's the thing. All of you watching right now, you're invited. You can present with us too. And if you've already presented, present again and invite your students and invite your colleagues. Um, starting at 4 o'clock today, you can click on the link that says present with us and starting at four o'clock, you'll be taken to a page where you can apply to be a tech team maker uh, member, please, 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 for September. You also can submit a proposal to uh, be a presenter on this fantastic day in September. So starting at four o'clock today, and that will be open for two months. So starting today until about June 9th, I think we gave you one extra day. Um, so from today through June 9th, submit your proposals for September. Um, and I'll, I'll share the date in just a moment. Um, a couple other uh, quick announcements uh, just before we get to our uh, closing session here. Um, so the Educator Collaborative also has many other ways that you can learn with us. Um, our study series, you can learn more about that from the recorded session that I did today. Here are just some of the amazing names that will be joining us. Harvey Smokey Daniels with Nancy Steineke, Kate Roberts with Pernille Ripp, Donalyn Miller with Christy Moratz presenting together. Janet Wong will be ending our year next year. Mary Howard, um, it's 12 online sessions. You pay one registration fee that starts at, or, or ends at $49. That's the most expensive. The cheapest is $29. Um, you pay one registration for a session or you can purchase the whole year and then you can share that one seat with every single person at your school. Um, so learn more about that from uh, the recording of the session. Um, then we also have the most intimate intensive way to study with the Educator Collaborative during the year is through our online virtual think tanks. These are cohorts of folks that are made up of no more than 10 people total, including the presenters. And these are um, the five cohort or the four cohorts we'll be doing next year. Every member of a virtual think tank also gets a full year study series, all 12 sessions there. So I, for example, will be leading with a colleague of mine, Carla Espana, the one on academic language, supporting structures to help English language learners and all learners in classrooms. Kate uh, Roberts and Maggie Beatty Roberts will be leading a virtual think tank across the year on DIY tools, um, pulling uh, resources from their book as well as working together in this small intimate online cohort um, to create your own tools to use for your classroom. And then Dr. Dana Stokoyak, who many of you were just raving about today as well you should, is leading the, the last two sessions. If you want more on social justice, join her group from Words to Actions, Real Meaningful Social Justice Teaching and Learning. She also is leading a session on coaching um, that she calls Coaching from the Core, Coaching Ourselves and Raising Everyone. Um, so you can learn more about those if you'd like more information from our website or from the session that I did today on Learning with the Ed Collab. Okay, drum roll, are you ready? Announcing the next date of the Educator Collaborative, the one that right after today's session, you will apply to be a tech team member, or you might even submit a proposal for. Our next one is Saturday, September 23rd. We do these every September and April, and we are totally honored 
and excited and blown away and just thrilled that our opening keynote is Dr. Debbie Reese. Dr. Debbie Reese is a tribally enrolled Nambe Owinge uh, member. Um, she is a First Nations uh, member, a federally recognized tribe of the United States. Um, her blog, uh, Native Americans in Children's Literature, um, is an incredible uh, resource of research, critical uh, literacy, um, and really reviewing the role of Native peoples inside of children's literature. Um, Debbie, uh, conversations with her, uh, reading her work, completely changes the way that, that I, I think about um, texts and representations of, of Native people. Um, it's such an incredibly critical topic, one that, that she does in such an inspiring, powerful, challenging way. Um, this day is one that you will not want to miss. You want to bring your colleagues around for it too. And we are just totally honored and inspired to have Dr. Debbie Reese joining us. So put that on your calendar, Saturday, September 23rd. Thank you, Dr. Debbie Reese, for joining us. And we, we're looking forward to having many of you join us on that day as presenters or tech team members as well. So now we're coming to our closing session. Um, I am uh, just honored beyond words to have uh, my friend, my colleague in education, Rasal Arbulel, to join me um, for this session called Caring for Our Kids, Supporting Immigrant and Refugee Children in our schools. Um, just two quick announcements and then um, we'll pass over uh, to, to begin. Um, so the first is um, Rusal has a book coming out, hooray! Um, so do out any day now, digital writing for English language learners. Um, if you go on to, if you're on the closing website right now, you can scroll down and see a link to the book where you can pre-order it right now. Um, it, this will be knock your socks off brilliant and I'm so excited. I also am so happy to announce that um, Rusal and I as well as fantastic other incredible amazing educators like her husband Mustafa, um, Lindsay Moses that many of you know, uh, several others including folks from Teaching Tolerance will be uh, leading, we'll all be leading together an ILA pre-conference in Orlando this summer on July 15th. It's Institute 8 called Supporting English Language Learners in Every Classroom and we hope that you'll be able to, uh, to join us for that. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, we can uh, jump in and get started. Um, just just before we jump over to to uh, Rasal, um, one thing to say, or you can you can come join us too. Um, one thing that we were talking about just as we were uh, prepping for our session um, is how uh, you know educators stand in the way of danger without blinking. Um, it's it's the thing that we do all the time that if there's um, a tornado We will take our kids to safety and there's stories of tornadoes or hurricanes where educators have thrown their bodies over their students to protect their kids from from falling bricks from a building um, We've shared in the devastation of educators who have stood in the way of bullets so their kids wouldn't be shot by a school shooter. Um, educators will step in front of cars, they will hold in front of doors. We put ourselves in front of danger to protect the kids we're in. And so this session is very much uh, about thinking about the and acknowledging, like I said this morning, acknowledging the real danger that's around us, but the ways that we can continue to, in that same selfless way, um, really work to protect the children that are around us in ways that really matter. Um, so uh, uh, welcome, Rasal. I'm so, so happy to have you here with us. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and um, it really means the world that you invited me here to talk about something so near and dear to my heart. And um, that is so relevant right now um, in today's political climate. Um, I wanna just start by um, saying that, like Chris, uh, Chris and I were talking about um, how educators are willing to sacrifice um, their lives basically to uh, stand in front of their children and protect them. And um, I think that um, it is our duty to um, um, connect and engage with parents, especially parents of immigrants and refugee students, those who are marginalized by the system as a result of so many elements, race, ethnicity, religion, socioeconomic status, uh, language, a combination of all those other elements. 
um, we need to know that they have a system to support, um, have a system of support and um, that they can turn to in their schools, in the classrooms and in the communities. Um, and uh, we remembered, uh, Chris and I remembered the quote uh, by Apollo Freire and um, he talks about how educators have a duty of not being neutral. There are many of us um, who want to discuss these issues in the classroom, but are afraid of talking about them because there is the assumption that educators need to only focus on the curriculum and nothing beyond that. And um, I'm here to tell you today that there are ways to focus on the curriculum, but as well integrate resources um, and relevant information, topics and issues in the classroom to help support immigrant and refugee children in your schools. Um, so I would like to start off a little bit by um, uh, statistics. I think numbers usually kind of give us a perspective about what we're working with here. Um, uh, according to the Census Bureau data, that's from 2015, I believe they'll have the 2016 data soon, 13% uh, of the U.S. population is compromised of immigrants. That might not seem like such a large percentage, but think about it this way. That's 40 million people out of 321 million people. That's a lot of people. Um, and um, immigrants and their U.S.-born children make up 27%. Now, if you really think about that, that's a huge number. How does that look like in the classroom? Well, um, the undocumented population alone is 11 million. But if you think about it now, um, I believe every classroom has one out of 10 English language learners. Um, again, one out of 10 students might not seem like a lot, um, but even that one person, that one student, um, needs that attention, needs that love, um, and needs that care. So um, another piece of data, immigrants make up uh, roughly 17% of the US workforce. And to me, I pulled that data out because um, it's important to uh, dismantle bias. There is always a bias and, again, an assumption that immigrants um, are not in the workforce. They're actually taking um, up space and they're on welfare. There's so many other stereotypes and assumptions that we need to dismantle. 17% is a lot. Um, Sorry, Chris, <laughs> with the slides, I'm just trying to catch up. Um, so um, the Pew Research Center estimates around 3.9 million school children um, had an unauthorized immigrant parent in 2014. Uh, that's about 700 and, uh, 725,000 of those children, again, were unauthorized themselves. Um, that's a huge number. Again, 3.9 million school children. Um, I think these stats just basically tell us about the importance of this topic and why we need to discuss it um, in the classrooms, with each other, in our communities. Um, and um, again, going back to the whole neutral uh, perspective that education is neutral, um, this doesn't need to be seen as um, many people say, well, is this like propaganda if I'm teaching about this? But this is what the actual political climate is asking us to do. Um, it is directly imp impacting children's lives, um, their families, and their homes. And if it's, it's up to us to address these issues in the classroom. And just that that number, I mean, 3.9 million, like you said, it's this isn't one kid somewhere. These are our kids across the country. I saw another statistic recently that said by 2030, 40% of, at least in the United States, 40% of public school students um, will uh, be English language learners themselves or come from a home where English is not the first language. Um, it, there there are, are children in every district um, that, that uh, are, come from these rich and amazing lives that are impacted by what is happening right now. I totally agree with you on that. Uh, there are children in every district. And then we also have to kind of be mindful of the idea that, well, what if you don't have immigrants and refugees in your classroom? What if you're not directly impacted? What if your students are not directly impacted? Do we have a duty to talk about what's going on? The raids, um, the deportation, the Muslim ban, the travel ban? I believe, yes. Um, 
The answer is yes, because the children in your classroom are not directly impacted. They still need to figure out and find out what is happening in the world, in their country, in their state, uh, to their neighbors. So I think it's still an issue that needs to not only be addressed, um, but needs to be tackled. How do we tackle this in the classroom is hopefully something that we're going to discuss today. Um, Okay, so for definitions, I think um, it, uh, many people think about um, the idea of words, and words matter. Um, we communicate through words, and um, there is also, for me, the first step in um, social justice work. Anyway, here we're talking about social justice work. Let's let's like <laughs> Chris, real talk. Social justice is basically you start with words. Um, words matter, so we need to define what we're talking about. Uh, refugees is a person who has fled his or her country of origin because of past persecution um, or a fear of future persecution based on race, religion, nationality, uh, political opinion, membership of a particular group of people. And immigrant children are those who, whose birth country is not the United States, but currently live in the United States. Um, there are so many definitions that we can uh, uh, work with here, but the idea is that um, if we're not sure about what language and what um, narratives we need to work with, um, again, as educators, it's up to us to go uh, do the research ourselves, figure out what words we need to use uh, to be empowered by that so that we can actually do the work properly. Okay, so um, one of the reasons why um, I decided, I mean, I'm, I feel so passionate about this work is because it has directly impacted myself. Um, I arrived to Canada um, as a refugee myself uh, from Iraq. And um, I, this was uh, many years ago. So my family fled Iraq uh, after the Gulf War. Uh, the Gulf War happened uh, sometime between 1990 and 1992. And it occurred between uh, for a period of two to three years, I believe. Um, so I was around grade one at that time, um, hovering between grade one and two. Um, I guess I kind of like um, uh, uh, revealed my age here, if you can do the math. Um, but uh, the war happened, uh, the Gulf War happened, and if you, you're curious about what the Gulf War is, the United States was a huge part of it, so I'd, I'd love for you to look it up and do a bit of research just to get, give you a background about why there was a war to begin with. Um, and my family, um, I mean, I lived in, my, I grew up in a middle, upper middle class uh, house, household with my grandparents and my aunts and uncles um, and uh, my cousins. And uh, one day out of nowhere, we just, you know, they told me, uh, my, my family said, you can't go to school anymore, we're at war. Basically what is currently happening right now, ironically today I'm talking about this, and you know, uh, we need to address the fact that uh, the U US is at war right now in Syria. Uh, missile strikes uh, happened two days ago, and um, you are at war. I say you because right now I'm in Canada. So I'm, I mean, Canada is also complicit because apparently they signed that agreement as well. So, um, so the war happened and my family um, uh, decided to flee Iraq. Um, and uh, this was, um, it, it was, you know, I, I can't even begin to tell you, um, I mean, uh, I remember um, I was six years old. Uh, my mom just woke us up one day and she said, um, we have to go. It was 5 a.m., I believe. Um, she had her bags packed and we needed to flee the country. And um, my uh, grandpa got a taxi for us. Not a taxi, just a driver to kind of, you know, drive all the way to Jordan, uh, which is uh, our neighboring country. So it's a bit of a eight hour drive. Um, now keep in mind when you're at war and the desert is the most scariest place that you could be. Um, anyway, long story short, it's a long story. Um, we left to Jordan, we stayed there for a year and then my family um, arrived here again as refugee status. Um, and then um, that obviously changed into immigrant status. And then later on, I got my Canadian citizenship. So uh, when I arrived here, I was an English language learner myself. I did not speak any English whatsoever. Um, and by then I was in grade five. 
Um, and I, I believe, um, the funny thing is when I, when I tell people my story, I believe that the hardest part about all of this is, um, I mean, war is terrible and being part of, you know, in war, I, I was lucky enough to leave and, uh, I have privilege that I need to recognize myself that we could leave. Whereas, you know, my neighbors stayed behind, um, and my family, um, the, the hardest part is coming here in Canada and I wasn't able to speak English and that was to me being in grade five, kids can be so cruel. Um, I know they're cute and we teach them and everything, but when you're in the classroom and there is one child that's different than all the other kids, that's another thing that we need to be mindful of. Uh, bullying happens. Apparently NPR did the research, um, that was published a week ago. Um, they said that the number one um, group of kids um, who are uh, currently being bullied are Muslim students. Um, and um, this is not shocking to me whatsoever because obviously what's going on right now in the States, um, but we also need to be mindful that um, Islamophobia is gendered and racialized. So what that means is um, when people are gonna bully uh, somebody based on their race, they might not be getting it, you know, right. So a brown person could be bullied and people would think, oh, they're Muslim, you know? So that's what Islamophobia means. It targets people who look like, you know, a stereotypical um, Muslim. And it's gendered in the fact that, you know, I wear the hijab and people right away are able to identify that I'm Muslim. So um, my husband, for example, if he walks on the street, he not meant, you know, that he won't be able to be identified as a Muslim, but I will be. Um, so the target is again on women, um, visible Muslim women. Um, now I want to continue with my presentation. So long story short, I mean, um, the idea here is that, um, uh, our immigrant and refugee children um, are directly impacted by sitting in the classroom and having to, um, you know, learn a new language, get used to a new culture. Um, not only that, make friends. That's one of the biggest deals that I had to go through. Um, it, it's really, really difficult. Um, and so these things, um, while we're being, you know, empathetic and kind and everything to them, we need to also see if other kids are being or behaving in the same way uh, to them as well. And, you know, telling your story of um, the Operation Desert Storm time that, that I, I mean, I remember being in school and uh, the point that you made of this, the concerns in the conversation here is not just for classrooms where we may have kids who are refugees or who immigrant or who are immigrants is for everyone. Because what I remember about my school experience during what we called Operation Desert Storm that displaced your family um, is how it, it was this like, pray for the troops, be happy for the troops, let's sing patriotic songs. Like, like there, there was only one version of that story being told to us. And just, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just so moved and troubled by playing back in time, myself being in school, and I remember the like patriotic anthems that, that were being said and the news broadcast that we saw. And at that same time that that was happening for me, your family was fleeing your home. And, and where I am and my country did that. And, and that, I think you're so right. That's not just a story for immigrant and refugee families because they already know it. It's the story and it's the work that we need to do for all of us. Um, uh, Rasal and I were talking about um, uh, sharing some additional stories. Uh, the challenges in the climate that we're in right now, um, it's dangerous to tell the stories of people to try to, to out them um, in, uh, in, in what's happening. We, we don't know what could happen to families. So um, while I can't give specifics, um, I, I will say, I, I know of uh, families, for instance, one uh, where um, the, of the, of this child's parents, um, one of them uh, suffered an illness several years ago, they're no longer able to work, um, and they're a naturalized citizen. Um, and uh, one of the other parents is um, a uh, uh, undocumented immigrant 
who has been working for decades has been paying taxes. That also is something that many people don't know, especially here in the United States, that many immigrants actually do pay, or undocumented immigrants actually do pay taxes to the United States. There are many systems in place for that. So has been paying taxes and adding to the economy. Um, and uh, for, for years, um, they could not afford to go through the immigration system in the United States. It requires a considerable amount of income or for someone who's willing to take the risk of you trying to process in. Um, and they, they haven't been able to do it. And they started to, to find ways through the legal system, through paperwork that it maybe could happen. And now in this current environment, they don't know. And, and the problem is this child, um, their parent could be taken any day including today, at any moment, who is the sole breadwinner of this family right now, who uh, in, in a, this menial job that they have is keeping the family afloat, this child in school. And that child is bringing that experience into our classrooms, your classroom, um, every day. And it also is a child who won't tell you that. Um, and in fact, many aren't. Um, just to share uh, one, one reality that, that's come out in the news um, and that, that uh, many of us who, who are trying to stay deeply in touch with um, the immigrant and refugee crisis, both in the United States, but this is around the world as well. We've had about um, 30 plus countries that have tuned in today. And, and I'm sure many of you, as you're listening and thinking about this, you recognize this isn't just here in the United States as in many other classrooms as well. Um, but one story that, that continues to come out is how as people are afraid, um, families are afraid of what this could mean for um, a parent like the 3.9 million that, that Rasal shared with us earlier. Um, some families are opting to hide or to hide in ways that, that perhaps they're still in public but are, are removing themselves from any possible interaction with, um, with the government or with ways that, that they could have records. This includes families that are stopping medical visits, including prenatal care for mothers who are expecting children um, and pediatric visits for their children, which directly impacts the children that we serve. There are families who are refusing benefits, including food benefits for women and children um, that are available in the United States. Um, there also have been a number of articles and stories about um, after, in the United States, raids that have happened recently where school systems have seen a dramatic drop in students attending class because they, they're frightened and they're worried. I mean, again, it goes back to our thought earlier of, um, you know, when there's a tornado, you protect your kids. When you're on a school trip, you make sure that they're safe from danger. Um, parents are doing this for their children as well, too. And it's not just along the border of the United States. It's, it's, um, it's all over. There was one um, in the Northeast. There was a, a, a district that noticed after some recent raids that happened, they had a 60% drop in attendance over the course of a week um, where less and less kids were coming to school because people were uncertain and they didn't know what to do. Um, so I wonder, Rasal, is now a good time that maybe we could go into, and I could, I could start with some of it, what are things that educators could do? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a good time. Okay, perfect. So, um, so having these stories in mind, and I mean, we're trying to we're trying to move ahead here because we just have this hour with you. But I, I, I'm still just thinking of of Rosal, your family's experience and knowing this the other side of that that I was on unknowingly as well. Um, just it, it's just chilling to me. It's just staying with me. So, so I think if you're watching right now and you also have been concerned or you're feeling more concerned from this conversation, we have a number of things that we wanted to share with you, some practical things to know and do. Um, so first of all, for schools and educators, it's, it's critically important that you don't wait until your district tells you um, because you likely have um, immigrant families somewhere inside of your district, if not inside of your school, and some that may contain undocumented adults as well. Um, or, or people or family members attempting to um, immigrate into the United States or into whichever country um, you're serving in. So it's critically important that you ask and find out what your district policies are um, around a number of the issues that we'll talk about next. Another big one just to say up front is that you should never, ever, ever, ever ask or keep notes on or otherwise have any way of discovering the immigration status of children or their families. Um, and this is to protect them. If you don't know, no one can ask you. 
And if you don't know, you don't have to say. So even if you think that might be true, even if you feel like a good thing to do would be to you know, bring this topic up and ask children, um, even if someone begins to uh, tell you their own story, um, approach them with love and full heart and kindness and, and listening, um, but just know that what you most want to do is avoid any conversation around their current status. You don't want to know. Of course, you can assume all that you want, but as long as you don't know, there's nothing that you can tell anyone, including any any, um, any officials that might be asking you um, that that really truly is not your role in, in those families' lives. Um, so so please take that to heart. So a couple of things to know that can support um, your children and families during this time. If you live and work in the United States, the um, FERPA laws, the laws that protect um, child and family privacy inside of schools, um, these are, are critically important and ones that you and your district likely rely on. And if you don't, this is something to ask about. In general, FERPA laws prohibit public or district schools, any school in the United States that receives federal funding from releasing any personal identify, uh, personally identif identifiable information from students student records without a parent or an eligible student, typically a student who um, is 18 plus um, or, or has been um, released from the care of their parents. Um, typically, uh, uh, this covers K through at least 11th grade, most of our students. FERPA laws allow, uh, not just allow, require you to not provide any student records to anyone. Recently, the New York Attorney General and the New York State um, uh, Education um, uh, Commissioner looked carefully at those laws and they believe that the FERPA laws um, do, do have some conditions that allow you to kind of work around the law. There are some, some ways where on occasion people, um, especially police, could ask for information. However, they believe that the FERPA laws do protect privacy around um, immigration and customs enforcement requests. Um, so if an ICE or immigration custom enforcement agent were to come to your school and were to ask for that information, um, uh, at least from, from uh, the heads of, of New York State, there's a belief that those FERPA laws do protect that children's information. Um, also inside of this, um, at least in the US, if you serve here, immigration and customs enforcement have self-imposed guidelines. And this is really important to, to know. The self-imposed guidelines mean that they have chosen for themselves as an organization that they will not enact enforcement actions. They will not come and detain people. They will not arrest them. They will not question them. They will not take them from what they call sensitive locations. So sensitive locations include, in, in their own guidance, schools, churches, hospitals. However, it's important to know this is their own guidance that they've put upon themselves that they could rescind any time that they wanted to. Um, so while that's there as a possible protection, it's not something that, that any of us could rely upon in terms of uh, the support that, that our children and families have. So in general, it's important to know, and again, this is something that, that we're asking, if you haven't already, that you directly ask and find out in your district. In general, um, any request for information that comes from any federal official um, know your chain of command inside of your school district. In most school districts in the United States and in many around the world, there are very clear policies for media requests or official uh, federal requests or, or police action requests um, that those typically cannot be answered by an individual teacher, many times should and cannot be answered by uh, even the administrator of a school building, they often have to go to a district lawyer or counsel or to a superintendent. Um, so it's, it's just important that you're really, really clear on, um, on what, wh where that fits and what there is for you to do. So, so just in summation, a couple of important things to know for educators. Number one, know your rights and the rights of your school or district. Um, uh, after today, if you're thinking about um, the experiences of, of kids like yours or the experiences of kids that, that perhaps you don't serve or you aren't aware of, um, do something with that and ask. Ask in your district, what rights do we have in our school or district and what's the chain of information and command should um, any actions happen or any requests come. If an enforcement action is happening, the advice of many in um, the um, immigrant uh, uh, civil rights community are two things, record and report. Um, so take video or write things down or write an email um, and report them. You can report them within your district for sure, up your policy command and also, which we'll share at the end here, um, to local civil rights groups and in fact to the media as well. And again, never, ever, ever ask, gather or store 
immigration status. This includes things like um, I've, I've worked with some educators who have wanted to do like a, um, you know, getting your citizenship night at their school for their families. In past years has been a beautiful thing to do. Having families come to your school and learn how to get their citizenship, that's beautiful and amazing if you work in a community that has that. Just know that an event like that now is asking people to out themselves. It's asking people to say, I need that information because I or someone I know doesn't exist. Um, so so it's, it's areas like that um, to, to be mindful of. Um, so now uh, we'll share some, um, I'm just grabbing this back up again, um, some, some other ways that, that you can support the parents and children in your school. Um, so there are so many different ways that you can support parents um, and children in your schools and communities as well. Um, I was talking to a couple of educators a couple of days ago, and um, Shauna Peoples, who was uh, named the Teacher of the Year for 2015, she told me about a program that they're running in her school. Um, and um, one of the program focuses on uh, providing different class, uh, classes for uh, the parents in their own language. So uh, I believe they had five main language uh, languages, Arabic, uh, Burmese, um, uh, I don't know, she, she listed a couple of languages uh, that were basically uh, most of the student population um, used. And so they provide programs like behavioral management, uh, digital literacy, um, helping parents figure out how to um, work with students um, using their tech, so apps, social media, um, and also uh, wellness classes. Um, I think I thought that was really cool. Uh, Zumba and yoga classes in their own languages that are provided by the community and that's the awesome. Yeah, it's it's just a way basically to connect and engage with the parents and as well kind of um, for me one of the reminders is that um, it it's, when we want to talk about you know dismantling uh, our biases and our stereotypes and uh, changing the system, changing the way we look at things. Um, relationships are the key to everything. They're the key to uh, being kind, they're the key to empathy, they're the key to just, you know, love and peace. Um, and what that means is, you know, if you have a relationship with um, a person, uh, you know, a parent who is uh, a Muslim or a, a black parent or a, a brown parent and uh, all types of different parents from different ethnicities, once you get to know them for the people they are, um, that changes everything, you know, all our uh, stereotypes and all our perceptions kind of, uh, we start to see them for who they really are as human beings. And I feel like those types of programs and um, uh, classes help to really connect with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, another strategy for me is also to answer their frequently asked questions. What does that mean? So if a parent comes and their uh, student is enrolled in your classroom, um, basically provide them with a toolkit or um, a type of resource that's translated, hopefully. Um, there's a lot of translation programs that are available that you can leverage uh, translated and um, it asks it answers questions like um, how will my child be assessed how will I know their marks um, um, how can I contact you um, things like you know that parents would be concerned about for me it's like when I started sending my daughter to kindergarten this year um, it's like when is when is her break time how many snacks is she gonna have uh, when is her lunch time <laughs> so things like that um, it, that would be really helpful if they're translated in their first language that way they can kind of um, there is a you know the communication gap is bridged now you know and then you're able to connect with them on a one-to-one -one basis so that's just one strategy um, another strategy that I wanted to uh, discusses uh, Larry Forlazo shared with me that they did a uh, parent uh, visit program with their um, uh, teachers so teachers visit the parents in their homes and I thought that was fabulous I mean his whole school was on board and um, he said that he told me a story that when he connected with one parent um, he brought the idea and that um, they are not um, they don't have a computer and so that was kind of a little bit difficult for them um, access to technology is huge and I think that that is one of the inequities that we need to address as well so 
uh, him and his school worked out a plan where they can provide tech to parents who can't afford it. And I thought that was a fabulous way of kind of connecting with um, parents of um, immigrants and refugee children or even English language learners as well. And when we talk about these things, um, I think to me the basis is empathy, love, and respect. I think, um, and how do we do that in the classroom? Uh, for me, I think it's important to provide different avenues for students to kind of help them share their stories. Um, I've been working with um, our past campaign uh, with a writing project focused on the refugee crisis. And so I worked with uh, schools and teachers to kind of help to discuss that issue in the classroom because oftentimes we feel like um, many teachers are not equipped to talk about these issues in the classroom. They don't know what resources to use or they don't know how to go about discussing such a huge topic. But believe it or not, um, it's, it's, it's funny that when you actually, when, when I read students writing that came out of that uh, uh, program, it's, it's fabulous that students can talk about and write about issues that even adults cannot write about themselves. And we really under, we underestimate children and kids and youth uh, to kind of uh, foster their own empathy and love and respect in the classroom. Because think about it this way, if you're going to discuss all of these issues in the classroom on the basis of love and respect and empathy, uh, now they're figuring out how to, you know, navigate the world in their own way in the classroom, outside in their communities, and figuring out ways um, to basically spread that, you know, uh, spread their, um, that word or, you know, spread th this ideology. Um, so I think it's so important to um, provide them with avenues. And that doesn't have to be through writing. It could be through speaking, uh, having a discussion. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, teachers use kind of, um, there is this app, I forgot what it's called, but they record, students record a video and then they send it to their teachers. That's for students who are kind of shy and they don't want to talk to directly face to face with the teacher. I thought that was a clever way. I think for my English language learners in the past, what has worked is writing. They love writing. I mean, there there's challenges there to get them to write about these issues. But once you surpass those challenges, you, you, the reward is just so, uh, it's it's heartwarming to see that they can uh, pour their hearts out on that piece of paper or that, you know, the screen and just, um, it's powerful. Chris, do you want to tackle? Oh, me? sure, yeah. So um, w one thing that, that we'd like to do for this last bit of time here is is just to connect you to, so how, how do we stay more connected to what's happening? Um, if uh, there there are, are many of you um, watching and teaching that that may actually be immigrants yourselves um, and may know members of your family or friends that are undocumented or refugees or are seeking refugee status. Um, and then there's, there's um, by statistics, a whole lot of others of you um, who may have no connection to that um, or may not realize that you do. And so how do we stay connected to really help ourselves remember and understand um, the experience of our children, uh, many of which are living with the daily fear um, of not knowing what's going to happen next to someone that they love deeply about. Um, so one of those ways is to connect yourself to um, resources and activities that can just help you stay more knowledgeable. Um, so one suggestion, and there are many, and, and find the one that's right for you, but just one, um, for example, I follow, I've signed up for um, text alerts, I also follow them um, on, on Twitter, is the United We Dream uh, group. So they've, and, and you may have seen these online, and if you haven't, you can find it at unitedredream.org. Um, they have a number of these, what to do if uh, immigration and customs enforcement agent comes to your door. Um, and it's advice, uh, if you go to that link that's at the bottom, um, it's available in, in a number of languages. Um, and, and here's the thing, number one, this is, extremely important to, to distribute and help and share um, with others. Um, it also, though, just reading these steps, um, if, if, you haven't, if you haven't thought about or empathized enough with what this experience is like for your children, just knowing these things um, brings you a little closer to what this experience is. So imagine you're a child whose parents, grandparent, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, um, 
is is potentially in danger. Um, their immigration status is in flux, and and they don't know what to do. And then someone comes knocking at your door. Um, the tips here are: do not open the door, remain silent in your own home, do not sign anything unless you have an attorney, report and record like we said earlier, and with your attorney and with reaching out and support of others, fight back. Um, Imagine that that's your life, that, that someone can come to your door and what you have to do is stay silent and, and be careful about what you sign. And then also think if you're living in that state of fear, and especially if you're living in that state of fear for, for the, your children in your family, um, how hard it is to make rational, thoughtful decisions at a time where you're living in fear and also at a time where you're not only fearful, but you, uh, you respect authority and you want to do what is right while also doing what is right simultaneously. Um, so, so connecting to organizations like United We Dream is just one of many ways that you can do what we um, unabashedly will say um, is teach into and work inside of the resistance. We, what's happening to our families, um, what's happening to our children is no different than a tornado coming through town um, it's no different than a school shooting uh, that you're protecting your kids from. It's no different. They're equally our lives that that are um, in in real danger. Um, so, uh, Rasal, did you want to talk a bit more about this? Yeah, I also wanted to just uh, expand on your point of um, deportation. I think it's important to remember the mental health of our children who are undergoing these uh, really, really harsh circumstances of you know, being deported or de detained, or even the idea and the fear of being deported and detained. I think uh, research shows that um, there is an increased occurrences of uh, PTSD in children who are in that circumstance. Um, there is also a negative consequences of a sudden loss of parental income. So right now, there is no income that is supporting this child, what are they going to do? Um, how, uh, housing and food security, that becomes a huge issue. Um, and so as a result of that, that increases their uh, chances of entering the child welfare system, which is, um, it's just, uh, it's, it's something that we need to consider, um, mental health and their physical health as well. And when you're saying that, I mean, that's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's, that's the bottom of the pyramid. You can't get to a place where you can be actively learning and engaged. The other piece of this, too, is that those things that, that we're describing here of potentially not seeking medical care, having loss of income from a parent um, or family member, um, not, not receiving adequate food um, because of this, those aren't effects that just happen in the short term. Those have long-term and lasting effects for that child's brain development when they're young, for the way that they interact and socialize um, in, in society around them and the place that they see themselves in that world. Um, all of these things affect the very core of what we as educators are working so hard to do, to higher order thinking skills, raise standards of children, really support them in their learning. Um, this is the bottom of that pyramid. And that's why I saw myself, and, and I, I know many of you are, are so passionate about this topic and trying to do whatever we can to support our children, because these are effects that will last beyond that's happening right now. Yeah. Yes. It lasts beyond their childhood, absolutely. And so I think that's uh, what we mean by here is to, um, to, teach the resistance, uh, teach about bias, teach about anti-racism, teach about anti-blackness, teach about Islamophobia and the LGBTQ rights and prejudice of all types in the classroom. I think um, it goes back to our first point that pedagogy is not neutral. We as educators inherently stand in front of our classrooms and, and students. Um, that in, in and of itself is an act of social justice. Um, the fact that you're willing to educate kids and the future generation. Um, so it's our duty for us to talk about these things and talk about these issues in the classroom. Um, and for me, um, many educators, I know we're running out of time, but one of the main, uh, the biggest fear that educators have when delving in these topics, and I know this because educators are constantly sending me emails and direct messages asking me, you know, they're fearful of talking about these topics, but the one thing I, uh, uh, you know, uh, try to remember when when I'm doing this work, and it's 
it's so difficult to do, um, is to take myself out of the equation. It's not about me anymore. It's about the kids. Um, it's about the movement. It's about the issue. Um, and if you take yourself out, what you get here is um, you're no longer fearful of, oh, how, what, what, am I using the right words? Am I using the right language? Um, uh, am I going to hurt someone's feelings or are my feelings going to be hurt? You just take yourself out and do what you feel is right. You know, follow your heart. It's, it's so basic, but I truly do believe if you follow your heart and your gut, um, we are going to be standing by our children uh, and hopefully support them in all the bit, best ways that we can. And, and I think to add into that, there's also a truth that, that uh, I mean, you shared from your own experience, our kids can't opt out of these conversations. And, and even our kids who are, even our kids who aren't directly affected because they're, they're not from an immigrant family, they're not fearful of, of their uh, citizenship status. These are also conversations that our kids, even in elementary school, and those of you watching know that this is true, even in elementary school are having in the hallways. Um, these are conversations that kids, like when, when you mentioned bullying earlier, who are afraid because they don't know if mom is going to be at home when they come back this afternoon, mm -hmm. um, they can opt out of it. And so I love that point, like take yourself out of it. Because if I take my own fear of what's going to happen to me if I do this out, um, or if I think I would stand in front of a moving car to help my class of kids behind me, like that's what all of you would do too. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a question of should I do this or not. It's that I have to. That's how I protect my kids. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's also if you're like, well, I'm not sure. I don't know how to talk about this. Um, part of it is just continual conversation and connecting yourself to people who are doing the work already and who are presenting the resources. So we just have a few, um, I'm going to say a few, and, and Rasal will say a few as well as we're, as we're ending here. Um, so some, some that I follow, um, and I'm sure you do too, and, and, and if you don't follow these, uh, we, we highly suggest you do. The National Immigration Law Center, um, you can follow them on Twitter, on Facebook as well. Um, CARE is a, a group of advocates for justice, especially um, for Muslim um, people uh, who are immigrants. Um, it's uh, lawyers that work together. They have both the national um, uh, group and just like the ACLU, they also have some local groups as well too. Um, then we also suggest if, you're, if you want to continue to be connected um, uh, to look inside of your local community. Here are two that are here in New York. There are many local organizations around the country and we invite you on Twitter. You could share out some of your own local organizations that you've connected to as well too. So the CUNY CLEAR project is the City University of New York has a free um, legal um, organization called CLEAR, um, which is made up of uh, law students and advisors, which provides free legal services, support, and training sessions to like know what to do if you're in an ICE raid, for example, um, to the immigrant community here in New York. Um, folks just have to contact them either through their Twitter handle or online, and they will set up support for you. They also can help direct you to your own lo local organizations as well. And the New York Immigration Coalition has also continued to be on the front lines of a lot of action that's happening here. Here. Um, and then a few more. Yeah, we have um, the American Civil Liberties Union, who has uh, been very active in this movement. Um, and they provide a lot of resources and a lot of uh, different ways and strategies where you can uh, leverage to support um, the, the um, not only uh, children, but also the communities as well. Teaching tolerance is one of my favorite resources when it comes to teaching in the classroom. And there is a lot of um, uh, if you click on their resources link, you can select uh, your lesson by topic, by grade, um, and um, they provide you different lesson plans and resources about all types of topics that you can think of, um, focused on social justice, race, ethnicity, culture, um, everything you can think of. So I think they're, they're fabulous when it comes down to practical uh, lesson plans. And um, the last one was, um, Muslim Advocates. Uh, I'll put it back up. Uh, no, that's fine. Uh, Muslim Advocates is just a national legal advocacy organization. Again, a lot of legal advice um, and um, also resources and information. If you're looking for news about currently what's happening, um, it's a good account to follow as well. And so uh, one thing we hope for you is that you, um, of course, take action. That's what we most want. Um, but that you, you, Think about 
not just your students that you may or may not know their status and may or may not know how, um, especially the current climate, uh, again, in the US and around the world um, is affecting them, but also thinking about how you, you're preventing the experience that Rachelle and I were sharing earlier of while her family was fleeing their home um, in danger for their lives, I, back in the United States, um, was learning about like patriotism and songs and, and was not aware of the impact. Um, what's been happening in Syria, um, it's, it's easy for us to kind of turn off the television and say like, oh gosh, it looks so horrible and then move on. Um, but but then that's the danger of, of we're repeating that same cycle. So so we want you to consider that part of the work here is to invest in your own knowledge and learning so you can support those kids who are most in danger now. But it's also equally and perhaps in some ways as important um, to also engage in conversation and work with children who are of the majority culture or who are not currently in the situation that others are in so that they're more aware of what's happening and as they grow into future adults they can play a more vital role in it or actually to to quote uh phil bildner this morning he said i you know people always tell me kids are the next generation they're not the next generation they're here right now we can do something about them right now um, our, yeah. our students are the future. That's that's exactly what it is. They are the future, and our, their voice is the future. And I think that um, uh, educators have the power to um, uh, create a generation, a future generation of um, uh, of good people that are kind-hearted and empathetic, and hopefully that changes the way things are um, going at um, you know from what we have right now and. Um, uh, to, you're fabulous. You have that power. I, that's all I want to. I want to let you know. You have the power to change the world in your child's um, uh, your child's classroom, uh, your kids' classroom. So um, please leverage that power. And um, uh, that's it. That's all I have. Thank you so much. For <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so so please um, be be sure to connect with Russell. Um, here is her Twitter handle, um, so you can uh, connect with her on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter already, please look out for her book as well. That's coming. And um, I just want to thank you for uh, being here with us. Uh, comments online already. Um, people are are riveted and stirred and um, just just so grateful for your story, your voice, um, the work that you do. Um, and, and just supporting all of us. Thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It was a pleasure. And uh, thanks to all of you. Um, thank you for spending all or part of the day here at the Ed Collab gathering. Um, remember, our next one is coming up at whatever date I told you now. I lost that slide somewhere. Oh, here, I'll find it. Um, our next one is coming up on September 23rd. We have Dr. Debbie Reese, who will be kicking off the day. Um, and we would love you to be a part of it too. So starting actually four minutes ago right now, if you click on present with us, you'll be taken to a page where you can either apply to be a member of the tech team. And I'll say again, please, 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 we'd love to have you, we'll train you. And it's an awesome experience. Um, but we also uh, would love to have you submit a proposal as well too. Those proposals and tech team application will close on June, I believe it's 9th. Um, so you can get your, your ideas and fingers going. Some of you are heading off to some breaks right now. So over maybe perhaps uh, when you get back from break, uh, you can, or even while you're sitting on the beach, if you're going on vacation, you can dream about what you might do with us. Um, thank you to all of you uh, for the love you give to your children, give to your colleagues for the love you give to your community um, and the love that you share and give and knowledge and sweat um, that you give to uh, this amazing profession that we share. Uh, thank you for celebrating the AdClab gathering with us. Please remember to pay the joy forward. Visit our charity page before you go this afternoon. Let's please stay in touch. Thank you, everyone. Take care.